David, I've been really focusing uh, for many decades uh, on fine-tuning as a probe of reality. And sometimes the better way to do that is to do the reverse and to say, what are some of the fallacies? What, what, is, what could be wrong about this kind of thinking? As a philosopher of physics, what are some of the fallacies of fine-tuned thinking? Consider? Well, the first thing I want to ask as a philosopher um, um, is, um, the first thing I want to do is to understand better than I must say I do exactly what the crisis about the values of these parameters is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, there is a kind of reasoning that goes on a, a lot casually in physics. This started in the late 19th century in statistical mechanics and has expanded out to include a lot of the ways that physicists reason about probabilities. It often goes under the name of the principle of indifference. Um, if somebody says to you, there's a marble in one of these three boxes, um, but I don't tell you anything further about which box it's in, um, uh, what's the probability that it's in box number two? Okay. And people will tend to say, oh, the probability is a third that it's in box number two, because after all, there are three possibilities of where it could be, and, uh, and I have no reason to believe one more than the other, and I ought to assign a probability of one third um, to its being in the middle box. Good. Um, it turns out that reasoning like this works extremely well in the context of statistical mechanics. Um, I think in statistical mechanics, it's an empirical discovery about the way the world is. But people have gotten the feeling that there's something a priori about it, okay? Mm -hmm. That all we have to say is, I have no clue which of these boxes the marble is in. And all of a sudden, I'm able to assign a probability that it's in box number two, namely one third. That seems insane to me, okay? Um, I don't know, that, that seems like a really suspicious example of getting something for nothing, okay? I start out with the claim, I know nothing about which box the marble is in. The next thing you know, I'm making detailed, precise, quantitative claims about the probability that it's in the middle box. This is very, very strange to me. It seems to me that the only reliable way of getting knowledge about probabilities, like the only reliable way of getting knowledge about the physical world in general, is empirically. Mm. We do a bunch of experiments in circumstances like this. We see how many marbles end up in box one, how many in box two, how many in box three. Um, um, we don't, you know, and, and we see how those statistics depend on the way the boxes are prepared and, and so on and so forth. A lot, of the, a lot of the way the atmosphere of crisis gets produced in discussions of fine-tuning is people say, gee, of all the values this constant could have had, yeah, right, yeah. what's the probability that it had this particular one, yeah. okay? Uh, uh, of course, as if the answer is supposed to be yes, very tiny, <laughs> therefore we have a crisis, therefore we have a problem we have to solve. I, I don't really understand exactly how that reasoning goes. If somebody says, I have no clue what box the marble is in, and somebody else says, oh, you mean the probability that the marble is in box two is a, ha is a third? The answer should be no. I just told you <laughs> I, I have know. no clue. <laughs> Which part of I have no clue do you not understand? Okay. I have no clue means I have no clue. So there are many cases, and you have to separate certain cases from others. So I think the case of, say, the flatness of the space of the universe is somewhat like this. People say, look, there's a crisis here. The universe is very nearly flat. The space of the universe is very nearly flat. Of all the curvatures that it could have yeah, been, yeah. what are the chances that it was this yeah. one? And they act as if the obvious answer is the chances are very low. We therefore have a crisis. We have something we need to explain. I don't understand that. Yeah. The world had to be one way or another. If we were to say, for example, 
of all the laws that could have been the basic laws of the universe, what's the probability that it was the Schrodinger equation, okay? <laughs> or what's the probability that it was Newton's <laughs> laws? It turns out to be Newton's laws, we say there's a crisis here. <laughs> there's something deeper we have to explain. <laughs> I don't understand this reasoning. It had to be one thing or another. There aren't any a priori probabilities that it was one as opposed to another. There are other cases, for example, the cosmological constant, which I think are quite different. We have other compelling reasons to believe from quantum field theory that the vacuum energy density, what's called the cosmological yeah, yeah. constant, should have had a value much, much yeah. higher than the so one we observed. To the right. Yeah. There we've got a real problem, okay? There we've got a problem to solve. The probabilities there are not coming from a priori reasoning, you know, in terms of principles of indifference or anything like that. They're coming rather from empirically well confirmed scientific theories that we have in other domains that are coming into conflict with what we see in this domain. And, and what we see is, is an experimental one because- That's you, right, you, you that's right. It's a very low that. cosmological right. constant. So. But if somebody says the chances are low that the universe was flat, why? Because think of all the curvatures it <laughs> yes. could have had. That doesn't, that, yeah. I, I, I'm, I must say I'm very puzzled about that reasoning and I think a lot more pressure needs to be put on uh, on the cosmologists here to say exactly what it is that we should find puzzling about that. That is to say exactly what it is that we should find unsatisfactory about a theory that simply posits that the initial conditions gave us a flat, uh, a flat geometry. So I would go, I, I, I appreciate that very much, and I'd go to the next step and says, well, what is fine tuning? Is fine tuning 1%? Is fine tuning because on the cosmological, but even, if you're 10 to the 120, right. if you're 10 to the 60th, is that fine too? I That's agree. 60 orders of magnitude. I agree. I, 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 but, I, I, but also the question is, wh where do they get these numbers? Once again, you need to go case by case. When they say, you know, the probabilities of the, of the, uh, of the cosmological constant being what it is are very low, I know how they calculated those probabilities. They calculated them um, as a consequence of empirically well-confirmed theories. When people say, on the other hand, that it's unlikely that the universe should have turned out to be flat, or it's unlikely that the initial entropy of the universe should have turned out to be very low, those calculations are being made not based on empirical theories that we have, they're being made in a completely a priori There's way no from the principle of indifference. Is, is, is there no inference from our understanding of the physical world that we can ask those questions? In those cases, I, I don't think it's been made clear what the principles are. So like I say, this differs between different cases. And therefore you must look at each individual case you to look even at each determine if there's a Very there's a carefully. Question and, and I think in general, whenever physicists find themselves reasoning in an a priori way, in a way independent of experience, whenever in particular they find themselves reasoning in accord with a principle of indifference in determining probabilities, they ought to stop and step back and ask themselves more carefully than I think they have been asking themselves what they're doing.